be mindful of what is out there, both on a government level, whether it's federal or state, and make sure that you've done your own risk management assessment of your workplace and of your clientele. And then put those policies in place, make sure they're widely distributed, and always implement them consistently. You are listening to Legal Skinny Podcast with Trisha Verita. I'm a 15-year licensed practicing attorney in the state of Texas. I created Legal Skinny because when I've been invited to do educational seminars on different subjects in employment law, employers and HR professionals would often ask me, where can they find out a little more information on this or a little more information on that? Look, there's a lot of resources out there but sometimes it's confusing and people are so busy. Sometimes people have only 30 or 15 or maybe even five minutes in their day to devote to learning something new. On this podcast, you'll hear me have discussions and interviews on topics relevant to employers. Disclaimer though, Legal Skinny is for entertainment and informational purposes only, not meant to provide legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Also, remember, Laws change, or they differ by jurisdiction, so this is not a substitute for seeking legal counsel in your jurisdiction on the current law applicable to you. Private employers are continuing to assess their level of risk as coronavirus continues to spread across the United States and globally. And nobody wants employees that get exposed while on travel or during other off-duty personal activities to bring coronavirus into the workplace and cause an outbreak of infections. While we have seen a lot of various travel restrictions across the world from country to country, we've also seen state by state restrictions and at some level, even county to county restrictions imposed in attempts to thwart the spread of this coronavirus. Early on in the pandemic, the state of Texas's governor, Greg Abbott, imposed quite a few travel restrictions and requirements for quarantines for visitors or returning Texans from various states across the United States which expired back in May during Texas's reopening. But now New York has emerged more recently, as well as several other states, in naming visitors or individuals traveling from certain states that are required to quarantine upon return. But where does all this leave employers with how to address these quarantine issues with employees? How far can an employer go with requesting quarantine of an employee or to request employees cancel personal trips or postpone non-essential business travel? Today, my guest is both a friend and colleague, Lisa Coppola. Lisa is a 31-year licensed practicing attorney and owner of her own law firm, the Coppola Firm, that does work across New York State. Her legal practice includes defense of businesses on the employment management side, business litigation, and personal injury matters. Since this episode is New York State of Quarantine, I knew Lisa being in New York could help me weigh in on what has been going on with these quarantine restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic and how quarantine affects employers with employees travel and other activities conducted personally and for work. We had a great chat on these issues, so I hope you enjoy Legal Skinny Podcast, New York State of Quarantine. Lisa, thanks for joining the Legal Skinny podcast. Uh, How are you doing today? Doing great. Delighted to be here with you. All right. Can you give us a little background on your work? Absolutely. So I'm I'm a serial entrepreneur up here in New York State. I own right now a garden design and construction firm and a law firm. I've been in practice 30 years and um, we have a variety of matters we deal with, but one of my favorites is the area of labor and employment law. I love that, a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> it's a lot of fun running businesses, lots of challenges, uh, but a ton of fun. 
yeah, I, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs are always looking for the next thing, even if they uh, the sell or, or get out of the business they're in. It's it, it can be quite of an addictive type thing. For sure. All right. So uh, you and I have known each other, been friends for for quite a while, of course, pre uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And as you know, I, I have some family in New York. Um, and so like most of America, I was watching uh, closely as New York really took center stage early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, several months ago, of course. So can you take me back to March and April and kind of give me, you know, your experience and, and you know, what was going on um, in, in kind of your words? Yeah, it's it's so fascinating. You know, March 15th, the Ides of March and Julius Caesar, and it sort of <laughs> seemed like that all culminated with um, the world in New York State kind of coming to a screeching stop mid-March. Um, we saw you know, incredible numbers of COVID-19 in the Manhattan area and also throughout the state. And so it really required us in, in the law business to, to stop on a dime, um, to be super flexible and required lots of businesses to do that. You know, we we mobilized immediately, most of us from our home offices, because virtually all businesses, except for essential businesses, were told they can't work in a commercial setting. It was it was crazy for a while there. Yeah, I, I know um it's been a really difficult time. You know, a lot of people um, you know were heavily suffering both economically and of course from the COVID-19, um, you know, condition or family members or employees having them, um, you know, back then, uh, Texas actually had a travel restriction that Governor Abbott's executive order put in place requiring a mandatory quarantine of a number of states, uh, which New York made the list. Uh, it also is a state of California, state of Connecticut, state of New Jersey, state of Washington, city of Atlanta, Georgia, city of Chicago, Illinois, city of Detroit, Michigan, or city of Miami, Florida. Now that kind of all sort of um, started around March 29th and continued through um, into April with the, then the restrictions being lifted when you know Texas was looking at, at being one of the first states to open up on May 21st, 2020, those restrictions, the governor lifted in another executive order. So I jokingly uh, referred to these lists, these travel restrictions as the naughty list for travel. Um, now it's it's you know a joke, but um, in in turn you know Texans shouldn't be surprised that now they're on the naughty list for travel some for some other states, including New York. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about what happens if you know um, well if anyone is is returning from one of these states that's on this sort of naughty list for travel, and including sure. if, you know if my fellow Texans and I uh, attempt to go to New York, what what exactly might happen? Right. So um, so New York, it's interesting. New York, New Jersey and Connecticut have worked collaboratively together, which is really terrific to see um, that sort of collegiality among states that are in close proximity to each other. And so New York has has the list that's shared by these other states of um, locations from which travelers will come and they are required to quarantine for 14 days if they choose to come into New York. And interestingly enough, it affects things like um, travel of New Yorkers. So if a New Yorker went to Texas, which happens to be on, I love your naughty list. <laughs> Texas is on the naughty list. So if one of us wanna come down and, and, and visit Houston or Dallas or Austin, and then we come back to New York State, we also must quarantine. Um, right now, there are 19 states on this list. So Texas isn't alone there. And essentially what we're looking at is a seven day rolling average. So for a state to get on the New York list, the naughty list. The naughty list. <laughs> yeah, over a seven day rolling average, the state has positive tests in excess of 10%. So positive COVID-19 tests in excess of 10% or the number of positive cases exceed or are greater than 10 for every 100,000 in population. So that list has been changing. The our governor changes it and it's available on the internet, um, but it causes all of us to take pause other than so-called essential workers. So there is a carve out for essential workers. If they're traveling into New York to help, for example, with the pandemic, 
or if essential workers leave New York, and some, some of us are calling that a loophole. So if an essential worker simply wants to leave New York to go on vacation and then come come back to New York, um, they don't have to quarantine. And some are questioning whether that's fair for sort of purely <laughs> recreational or social travel. But in any event, we've got this quarantine in place. It calls for um, the, the governor and the government to assign um, fines if someone is found to not quarantine. And if they cause harm, that's the standard, there's up to a $10,000 fine to be applied. So it's going to be interesting to see how this develops as different states become what we're all calling hotspots, right? Yeah. I um, As far as the uh, the essential worker is, um, are you aware of if New York defines that like similar to the, I think the 16 categories and the, um, you know, critical infrastructure um, or is there a different standard that they're looking at for that? Yeah, New York's created its own standard. Um, the governor in one of his earliest um, executive orders defined essential work and then anyone who works in or supports essential work is considered an essential worker. It is arguably broader than the federal standard. So, um, so it encompasses uh, uh, quite a number of different types of employees. I'll give you an example. We all believe, of course, that medical professionals are essential workers, right? Sure. But somebody's working in a consultancy, for example, doing billing or doing coding for a medical practice, because that person supports an essential business, that person also is considered an essential worker. So um, lots of support for other essential businesses. If you support banking, which is an essential business, if you support construction that helps with the military or defense, um, then you're considered an essential worker. So it's it's rather broad. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I, I think I read somewhere too where there are some New Yorkers that, you know, um, uh, I hate to say the word fled, but I chose to uh, remove themselves from New York during the, the high time of the COVID-19 um, pandemic for New York uh, and, and have been frustrated with uh, returning because they are now in one of these 19 uh, naughty list um, travel list uh, states and um, you know they're just trying to get back into their house or, or condo or apartment uh, especially some that are trying to get back into the city uh, so of New York um, you know uh, I, I, it's still, there's no exception that if you're a New Yorker, right? I mean, even if you're a New Yorker, you go out, like you're saying, unless you fall That's under right. these essential workers, you're still expected to quarantine. You're still subject to these fines. Is that right? That's absolutely right. You know, we have an enormous population of what we call snowbirds, right? We're up in the Northeast, so winter can be challenging up here. And 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 great swaths of our populations head to Florida, head to Arizona, head to Southern states for the winter. And those are exactly the people you're talking about, Tricia. They, um, they want to come home. You know, it gets warm here. Uh, we we're joking. It's getting towards 90 in, in <laughs> the woods today. And so our snowbirds want to come home. But there is no exception if they, even if they're resident of New York State, when they come back from one of these, um, these states that have some um, significant COVID-19 numbers, they're required to quarantine for 14 days. No question about it. Uh, very interesting and I'm sure frustrating to those uh, to your fellow New Yorkers in that realm and trying to figure that out. Uh, the 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 little bit about like if if you're on a plane, you fly into New York, do you know anything about um, exactly what's supposed to happen? When I was looking back at the governor, uh, Greg Abbott's order of Texas, um, when he sort of implemented his quarantine list, he had that um, individuals would be filling out forms uh, on, upon disembarkment. Um, and then uh, that would been then the DPS troopers uh, or other peace officers would complete, you know, take these forms from the, the individuals that are coming from one of these states or cities and then verify it against the driver's license or passport. And I guess determine whether or not the individual is expected to quarantine. Is New York kind of doing something similar to that? It's very interesting. New York doesn't have detailed um, guidance on how the state or how state um, enforcement officers might act upon arrival. So we're not seeing that happening um, the way your governor Abbott 
handled things a couple of months ago. Um, rather, our state enforcement mechanism, although um, government actors have the right to enforce, we just don't have the practical implementation here. Rather, what we're seeing in our guidance is that um, uh, folks are being asked essentially to report violation. And, and so there, there are forms available for reporting, you know, reporting neighbors and colleagues, I suppose. Oh, go oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, right? It's, it's a very interesting scenario. Um, but I think everybody is, is, of course, sensitive to making sure that the public health takes priority here. Yeah, I could see that. So uh, let's kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about, um, you know, now that, you know, we, we've seen these kind of restrictions, both our states have, have implemented or currently have them or, you know, um, although my state obviously has, has taken some of those back when they opened up, but um, the how employers should be handling this. I mean, when, when can an employer require workers to self-quarantine, you know, uh, when I'm kind of looking at this, I feel like there's some clear guidance and then there's these real murky gray areas and kind of like, um, you know, what should employers do? Obviously, it, it feel, I feel like this is always what, you know, because, you know, we both practice in the area of labor and employment law. I feel like the employers often want to go into the gray murky area just willingly. Like they're just like, let's wait in there. Right. Uh, it, it seems to be, of course, um, you know, one of the key issues as uh, to how they try to solve problems is is wade into that gray market here. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about like what what you think if you have any thoughts on the clear guidance and the and the gray market. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we in New York had some emergency legislation passed back in March, um, a special COVID paid family leave. Um, law. So in addition to the federal leave laws that were put in place at the end of March, we've also got this New York state law. So our employers have some pretty clear guidance about how to address quarantine, how to address people who need time off. Um, but it's so important for them to have their own very clear, very transparent and consistently applied policies in place. And I'll tell you, I mean, we're now in July for the past, you know, three months, we have been writing policies nonstop for our employer clients. And, you know, we, we made sure that they had in place not only policies dealing with quarantine and leave and whether it's paid and whether it's unpaid, but also things like working at home and confidentiality and, and all of that. So, these gray areas, I think that as we approach them, I think the best um, the best approach we as lawyers can take is encouraging our clients to do that that piece of preventative medicine, get those policies in place so that they can apply them and then and not be accused of taking action that's improper or discriminatory or things like that. Yeah, I think. I, I, I can totally understand and agree with where, where you're coming from with that because, um, of course, so, uh, you know, the pieces of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, you know, the federal piece, and I see what you're saying that New York has a, and other states probably um, also have uh, potential state legislation or already had paid sick leave laws in place. Um, uh, in that kind of realm, they built in with the FFCRA uh, when it, it was implemented um, April 1st, if you know, you have a required government order or advice by employees healthcare provider, which sometimes can come from related to travel or other reasons of being exposed to a COVID-19 employee or, or other individual, allows for this sort of quarantine mechanism. And so um, that, that would be a place, of course, where there would be, I think, you know, seeing some clear guidance that employers can be restrictive about <laughs> wanting to know and requiring some type of quarantine if, an individual falls under that. And then of course the FFCRA, if they haven't used it up, you know, would allow for some paid sick leave in that um, potential opportunity when the employer is, is, is making that choice. But that, I think that's right. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I guess the, um, the, the key, right, would be when we get into that gray area of when we don't have a government order, we don't have an employee's healthcare provider, and then having the policies around what you do with that, like where where can you go with that? Um, employee takes vacation out of state. Maybe it's not in one of these. Like, for instance, Texas doesn't have any travel restrictions right now, uh, even though, I, as I just read, they had quite a few. 
So, you know, if someone goes and travels to, um, you know, Florida, which has quite a few COVID-19 cases right now, comes back, you know, what can the employer do when they don't have that order in place? And I think that's kind of tricky. You know, how much um, can they restrict that? You know, some companies are trying to create policies around that. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think it is tricky and it requires a fair amount of thought in advance, even in the, these changing times. And what we like to talk about is what is the nature of the workplace? So here's an example. Um, when when you work in an area where you might have a vulnerable population as your clients, you know, physicians offices, for example, um, we've we've worked with. Um, folks and talked about, you know, how do you want to protect not only your staff, because great employers want to make sure their people, their teams stay healthy. Um, great employers also need to be particularly um, attentive to who their customers are. Are they coming in? Are they, are they sick? Are they vulnerable populations? And what we find here in New York, and it may differ in other states, is that Businesses can have in place policies that require quarantine, even if there isn't an order in place from a government like a New York or a Texas. So policies, as long as they are um, clear and transparent and non-discriminatory, right? They can require quarantine if somebody in, in your instance went to a hotspot state and then came back in or went to a hotspot city even and came back home. Um, so we're seeing a lot of businesses take this very seriously. Um, whether the leave is paid or not comes down to not only these laws, both state laws and federal laws, but also comes down to the employer's sick leave policies, PTO policies. We've put in place, for example, quite a bit of COVID specific amendments to leave policies. So some of our employer clients want to be more generous where PTO might not be allowed for a particular reason. They're opening it up to their people to make sure that everybody is focused on taking care of their health and making sure that if there's a question about whether they might have been exposed, they're not coming in and exposing others. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. I would you say also, you know, in, in implementation of such policies, uh, of however the employer does um, go forward with them, you know, making sure that they're actually implemented in a non-discriminatory manner, that you're treating everyone the same way. Absolutely. So that's you know, it's 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 a significant issue, right? You, you as employers, we've got to be. Um, absolutely, I would call it vanilla about how we apply our policies. We can't, because somebody might be particularly important to our business, we can't say, well, we won't apply the policy to that person because we really need Sammy to come back to work. No, we've got to apply those policies consistently across the board because, well, one, it's the right thing to do. And two, we don't want to walk into some potential legal liability because we've failed to consistently apply or implement policies. And so education's huge. You know, um, when we work with business owners, we're, we're consistently encouraging them to make sure their managers understand the policies so that managers, because their managers are usually the first line, right, who get asked questions. So the managers understand it and then can convey the information accurately and consistently to all the employees too. You know, it's, it's, this is, this has become a burden for employers. There's no question about it. Um, but the more they can educate their people to understand that what they're trying to do is make sure public health is is a primary concern, then I think I think they come out of it at the other end, gaining not only the understanding of their teams, but also the loyalty of their teams. And we can't forget that, you know, in, in the midst of this, we can't forget employee morale as well. Yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're spot on with that. I, uh, as the, as they delve into, you know, um, what type of potential uh, restrictions, if any, an employer, and, and they say they go into the gray or murky, or, or maybe what, you know, based on state law, you may feel there's some more um, clearer guidelines, but um, how far uh, 
can they go? I, you know, I kind of wonder myself looking at this as you see these restrictions right now, it's under travel. Are we going to see it under risky behavior? You know, do you need to disclose that, you know, someday, uh, you know, uh, baseball might get started again or, God, you know, God forbid the football season, you know, and right. people want, right. people are fans. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they want right. to get out there and um, that, that could be considered really risky behavior. So is the employer going to require is, are they going to have those means? Does it start to get slippery slope? I, I think that's a little confusing. Right. And, and once you kind of go in there and start asking all these other different questions, it's like what you just said, you know, everyone's got to be treated the same. So you can't be like, well, the employee that is, you know, the high level key employee, you know, is doing all these risky behaviors and we're going to accept that, you know, um, which which could clearly walk you into sort of a disparate treatment of another individual um, that, um, you know, maybe also did those risky behaviors and the employer's frustrated uh, with them taking that action. What do you think? Yeah, without a doubt, you know, at, at the risk of sounding, you know, like, uh, employers should always be consulting with their legal counsel. This is an area where employers should be consulting with their legal counsel because there will come a time when the questions become too intrusive, right? Where the where our you know government, whether it's federal or state government, says no, you really can't ask that question, right? What did you do Saturday night, right? Typically, that's that's off base. We can't ask those questions of our people in, in, uh, in the workplace. But um, but given the public health uh, issues relating to the pandemic, you know, the, the federal government for sure has loosened up the ability for employers to ask questions. But I, I still think um, it comes down to a case by case scenario. And um, good legal counsel is an employer's best friend these days. Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, speaking of which kind of, you know, we, 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 we as far as whether or not, you know, um, there can be some question asked, you know, we've gotten a little guidance from the EEOC. I, I know that you and I are both familiar with this, but I'll just mention it for anyone listening that uh, when the EEOC guidance came out for the pandemic preparedness in the workplace and the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is basically if you're an employer subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, when the CDC declared uh, that COVID-19 was a pandemic, uh, the EEOC came out with this other set of guidance that will now sort of shift the rules. Now, of course, they've said clearly once the CDC pulls back that there's no longer a pandemic related to COVID-19, then, you know, the regular rules then would probably come back into play. But during these, you know, pandemic rules, they did kind of address, you know, uh, the issue related to travel, at least maybe not football games and baseball games and other, uh, you know, potentially risky activities. Um, but when an employee returns from travel during a pandemic, must an employer wait until the employee develops influenza symptoms to ask questions about exposure to pandemic influenza during the trip? Uh, the EOC said, no, these would not be disability related inquiries. If the CDC or state or local public health officials recommend that people who visited specific locations remain at home for several days until it's clear they do not have pandemic influenza symptoms, an employer may ask whether employees are returning from these locations, even if the travel was personal. What are your thoughts on that? Have you seen um, that being used? Absolutely. I, th I think it's used widely here in New York. Um, we're seeing and we're creating policies and disclosure forms that call for this sort of information from employees. We're asking them and we're allowed to do that under the law. We're asking them where have they traveled. We're asking them to tell us, you know, to tell us truthfully where they've been and if they've gone outside of the particular approved area. And for some employers, they're comfortable with our governor's naughty list. So if you, if you head to a state um, that you must quarantine, then the employer's policy is going to say that. But other employers, as I was mentioning earlier, that might tend to particularly vulnerable populations of clients or patients, um, certainly in the healthcare arena, we see this a fair bit. If somebody travels, even within our New York state, the policy may say, if you've traveled outside of several counties, please tell us that. And if that's the case, we need you to stay home to make sure you're not an asymptomatic carrier, right? I mean, that's that's one of the issues we've seen come up 
you know, from the scientists is it's not just folks with symptoms who might um, who might pass the, the the virus on to others, but it's asymptomatic folks. So we're seeing a lot of these policies. We think they're really smart business because, and, and it's not certainly a topic for labor and employment attorneys, but there could be claims made later. There could be claims made by employees or customers or clients that, well, you, you uh, allowed somebody to come to work who could have been sick because they went to a naughty list state. Because they went to Texas. <laughs> because they went to Texas. Jeez. <laughs> right? And, and so businesses have to be mindful of those risk management issues. And, and they, as they kind of try to figure out the policy issues, I think we should note, right, that, um, you know, if, if the employee is covered by a union or has employment contracts, that may play into this too, right? Without a doubt, without a doubt, sure. Um, you know, collective bargaining agreements govern the relationship between employer and employee. So generally what I'm talking about is at will employment when there's not a contract involved. Um, but certainly I, I know that our our union colleagues are just as concerned about public health as you know the management side of the equation is these days. So hopefully they could work collaboratively on ways to ensure the workplace remains safe. Yeah, I think we've seen that play out, particularly in the professional sports realm, you know, uh, where right. you know, the, play, the players unions versus, you know, the leagues trying to figure things out. But yep. what if an employee takes a vacation or is on, um, has just off duty work? And, and if you restrict the employee too much, do you have any thoughts, Lisa, on, um, you know, is that going to get you in trouble with the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Department of Labor? Should you, you know, if you put too many restrictions on them, is it going to be considered you know, where they're on call almost. Right, right. And and there are concerns about that um, under the federal law. And some states have those sorts of on-call laws as well, including my state here in New York. So again, it it takes it takes be a wary. lot of time, right? <laughs> so to, be wary. <laughs> be wary. Right? Don't think you can just lock that employee up in a box and say, hey, you can't do anything. <laughs> Stay home, don't leave your bedroom. Right, we, we can't do that. We've, we've got to make sure we're being mindful of all those pre-COVID laws because they haven't gone away, right? right. Uh, I feel but, like employers are so scared that the workforce is going to completely get, they just got you know maybe back open. They have an eco economical issue. They're trying to have jobs for people and now you know, they don't want the whole workforce to go down. So there is this sort of like anxiety to you know prevent the spread as well as try to figure out kind of what the right thing to do is and you know, Sometimes you forget, you know, those other laws are still there. And, and the Department of Labor I've been watching is still still right on there enforcing those. Oh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes. Uh, and so, right, it's, 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 as we've been saying, it's a big challenge for, for business people and, and employers to really navigate these murky and, and, and roiling waters. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot to consider. And when you're looking at before you shift into something that's uh, that I've seen in some news stories recently, just just to clarify, uh, quarantine is a little different than you know uh, the stay at home or shelter in place orders some of the states have put in place, right? I mean, if you're quarantining employee, um, you know, there's um, and or state or local guidance is quarantine, they're expecting you to stay home, like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. There are very clear um, rules and 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 uh, regulations around this. Usually, it's a Department of Health, either a state or a local Department of Health, will list what quarantine means. And for many, if not most, people in the COVID arena, it means not only stay at home, but also isolate from other members of your family. Um, always be masked up. Use separate. Um, separate bathroom facilities, you know, don't take family meals, have, have food delivered uh, and stay in a, actually in a particular location of your home where other people are not allowed. So this isn't um, just don't come to work. This isn't, you, you can go out and play a game of tennis. Um, quarantine is serious business. Yeah, but if they can quarantine and they are asymptomatic and they, they have an ability to telework, they still get paid, right? I mean, there's still a way for an employer to find a solution to this. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are so many kinds of industries and professions where employees can telework if they're up to it, if they're, as you say, asymptomatic, if they're not experiencing um, any sort of debilitating symptoms. It can be, in large measure, business as usual, just in a remote way. Yeah. Um, if they're entitled, of course, to FFCRA, then the employer will just have to sort of work that out with whether the employee, you know, um, they want to use that time then or or save it for potentially if they if they get infected or some other qualifying reason. But um, that's kind of an employee can an employer can kind of work that out. Now, I kind of want to switch gears to ask you about a news story I saw the other day, uh, which was a little particularly uh, disturbing, where an employee was arrested for allegedly creating two documents forging a county health services director's signature. Uh, one of the documents was stating that they were required to uh, participate in a 14 day quarantine. And then the other one was um, the release document. These actually were modified off of real documents. So the individuals that gave um, this person the document or allegedly gave it to them uh, also got in trouble. Um, I feel yeah. like this adds a whole other layer uh, of what employers have to be thoughtful about this issue of fraud. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, pr pretty disturbing. And, you know, if, if I can editorialize for a second, it's reprehensible. You know, there are real people suffering from this virus. And for somebody to take it upon herself or himself to sort of fake it, to try to get time off from work, it's, it's really un unacceptable um, set of circumstances. So employers, you know, without being skeptics about everything, certainly um, it's incumbent on them to ask questions within reason. Um, we're seeing a lot of this in New York, in, in, in my part of the country. Oh, really? also, yeah, yeah. And it's very unfortunate. Um, so our um, we, ha we see it in unemployment as well. We've been asked to report when when we think that somebody is declining to return to work for an inappropriate reason. You know, they're lying about it. Um, and there should be situations where um, folks are held to account if they're committing fraud because that just, you know, it hurts all of the honest employees and employers across the state or even across the country. Um, you know, in a situation like this where somebody faked, you know, a quarantine order, my view is termination is an appropriate consequence to that. Um, if, you know, if, for example, the employer relied on that fraudulent document for FFCRA leave, for example, and took the withholding tax credits, does that make the employer a party to that fraud? Right? Good point. I mean, I think if they go along with it, it could. That's the... Yeah. The same with unemployment, you know, Texas having the same thing. I'm seeing, you know, that the Unemployment Commission here is, is starting to investigate these potential, um, you know, uh, fraudulent claims related to unemployment. I think employers, you know, uh, have could get in trouble if they are helping employees get unemployment where it is not appropriate for whatever reason. Um, that Those fraud claims are real. Uh, there are civil and criminal penalties here for that. I, I don't know if there is in New York, I'm sure. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And and sometimes that's confusing because, you know, some employers have these close relationships with their employees. They want them to, but they, you know, they want them to get, you know, paid, um, but crossing that line to where, it, you know, it maybe isn't appropriate. Now, of course, you know, there's, there's clear guidelines on what's appropriate with unemployment. I think the Unemployment Commission's, you know, um, God bless them, have been completely overwhelmed across the United States. It's a, right. For all those workers, that's, it's been a really tough job um, trying to work through uh, the many calls, probably people angry with them, you know, employers frustrated, employees um, frustrated with the process. Um, certainly, right. they didn't anticipate this. Many, I mean, at least over here in Texas, the, the, the commission, you know, at some point they were struggling to answer any phone calls, you know, and try to respond. Um, to particular issues, which I think is why now things have calmed down somewhat and they're trying to do these investigations of fraud. But um, I, employers being conscious of that is is important, right? Absolutely. And, you know, we have a sort of a blanket policy. If you're offering a return to work to employees, make sure to document that, make sure to do it in writing, even, you know, printing out an email or a text helps document that. And if the employee refuses to come back, 
contemporaneously or at the same time document that as well so that your records are very clear because again um, the employer doesn't want to inadvertently or unknowingly walk into liability that a, a government you know enforcement bureau or enforcement agency might might question that employer i love that that's that's great um great stuff and um, information there lisa so yep. looking forward here all right um yep. I feel like we've talked about a lot of things related to quarantine, what quarantine is, the fraud, mm -hmm. the other issues, the gray marquee, uh, the clear guidance. Um, but, you know, if quarantine is going to be a continued method, right, to combat uh, COVID-19 or to reduce the spread of COVID-19, at least from the government's perspective and the local, um, the federal state um, guidance, you know, they're going to keep changing these regions, you know, I, um, you know, I talked with someone else about whether or not, you know, at some point we may see full federal guidance on, you know, what the standards are um, as far as, you know, restricting travel. But regardless, you know, right now it's sort of like, um, like a quilt, a patchwork of trying to yeah. keep up with this. How um, do you see this going? Do you think employers are going to be expected later on to have really paid attention to which states are quarantining who? Well, I think employers need to be mindful that it's out there, right? And if on a state-by-state -state basis, there is information, I would say employers, you know, in their human resources functions should at least periodically monitor those so-called <laughs> naughty lists, right? And, and know it. But ultimately, a policy making it the employee's burden to understand what is either within an approved range of geography or outside of an approved range of ge geography is perfectly acceptable. It, it, would, it would be okay to do that in my state, again, absent a collective bargaining agreement, to tell employees in a policy, you know, you have the obligation to review the governor's executive order, the Department of Health's identification of what states, you know, right now there's 19, Maybe it'll be reduced a little bit, but maybe some other states might be added across time periods, right? You've got that obligation. And then when you return to the workplace, you have the obligation to certify truthfully where you were. And if you were in one of those places where quarantine is required by law or quarantine is required by an employer's policy, then you've got to follow that. So I think it's it's a collective responsibility, right? Employer, employee, it's always better if there's open communication and there's cooperation there. But ultimately, if the employee is the one doing the traveling, right, there has to be some responsibility on the part of that employee to make sure he or she knows what the consequences of those decisions might be. Yeah, knows about those naughty lists. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. That's Indeed. what you'll be calling them, Lisa, after today. I, I now, yeah, now New York has has a naughty list. I love it. I love it. It's great. If you don't oh, mind, borrow it. Go ahead. Take it. Steal it. I love it. <laughs> this is a, this is obviously great information. I, I can't thank you enough for you know taking the time joining me here today. Um, before we wrap up, do you mind if we do the legal skinny rundown? Yeah, would love to. Okay. All right. Beach or mountains? Mountains every day. Elvis or the Beatles? Oh, the Beatles. <laughs> Most influential book you've read? Honestly, um, from a Texan, Brene Brown, a book called Daring Greatly. Love it. Uh, dead or alive, which famous person would you invite to dinner? I think it would be Glennon Doyle, who runs a charity called Together Rising. Very interesting. Yep. All right. Finally, in one minute or less, what is the skinny on quarantine during COVID-19 for employers? The skinny on quarantine is um, be mindful of what is out there, both on a government level, whether it's federal or state, and make sure that you've done your own risk management assessment of your workplace and of your clientele and then put those policies in place, make sure they're widely distributed and always implement them consistently. Love that. So if someone wants to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, I'd love to hear from them. They can email me. Um, the easiest email is info at coppola-firm.com 
or give a call up here in New York State, 716-839-9700. Now, they don't, they don't have to quarantine just for calling, right? No, you can call at will. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Lisa. And that's the legal skinny on the New York State of Quarantine. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Legal Skinny Podcast. Do not forget to subscribe to get future podcast episodes. Also, check out LegalSkinny.com to join our newsletter and get details on all the educational resources we offer for the employer. Also, disclaimer, remember Legal Skinny is for entertainment and informational purposes only, not meant to provide legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship laws change or they differ by jurisdiction. So also remember, this is not a substitute for seeking legal counsel in your jurisdiction on the current law applicable to you.